My name is Benita Desor. Um, I was born in Canada, in Edmonton, Alberta. For 23 years, I've lived here now. Um, I have two parents, of course, <laughs> three brothers, um, two older brothers and one younger, and I've been here my whole life. Um, so I was born in a Hindu family. My parents are both from India, and they came here when they were around 20 years old to Canada. So um, we were born in a moderately religious family. We practiced Hinduism only on certain occasions, like uh, Diwali, which is a festival of lights, that sort of thing. Um, my family always believed that there was a god. However, they weren't as much as practicing as uh, some other Hindu families, maybe. Um, and they, they're still Hindu, and uh, I converted to Islam a year ago. So I think um, as I grew older and, and uh, went to university, there's always a moral code embedded in us because we grew up with traditional cultural values. However, growing up in Western society, they were a little bit looser than they may have been if we grew up in India. So I think you always had strong ties to Indian culture, to Hinduism. That was sort of part of your identity holistically. However, it wasn't as, you weren't educated in it as you may have uh, assumed you were. So it was more of, um, more of a part of your identity, but not really in practice. So you know, I think it was something in the background. Um, especially when I was younger, it was more of, it wasn't as embedded in us, it was, it was more so in the background than, um, than now. Well, I think, I think one of the most important things to note is that our, our parents came from India hoping to give a better life for their children in Canada. And I think a lot of immigrant parents face that when they're making this decision to leave their ties in their home country and come to Canada. So um, I think that's why the focus growing up was on education, was on school, doing well, um, having good friends, and just, just that sort of monitoring, the same sort of one that any, any parent would want to raise their child in. And so I think that's where the focus was. It wasn't so much on religion. So that's why for the majority of my life up until university when I was more curious about Hinduism, that's kind of when um, I, I wanted to actually question our religion because I felt it was more important. I, I believe there was a creator, however, I wasn't buying into as much um, um, what we had learned growing up. So I started taking some courses uh, um, in philosophy. So I did my bachelor of science degree and I did, um, I minored in philosophy. So I took some courses on Hinduism and I studied concepts of um, dharma, which is like your duty to your family, and karma, which is bondage from action and, and from the dunya, as we would say now. Um, and there were some really good moral codes, some really good ethics in Hinduism. However, as a religion, with concepts of uh, worshiping idols, because we do have idols. And growing up, you would see them in the house, like uh, different gods in statue form. And for me, that, that, wasn't, that didn't make as much sense, so I explored it further. And, um, and I, I started to realize that, that things in Hindu Hinduism, being the oldest religion, didn't really line up with what I personally believed. So I continued to explore it into um, Islam and Buddhism and all these different religions, Christianity, and I just found that um, those religions had a little bit more to offer w as what was in line with my own personal beliefs. Hinduism is well known for the process of reincarnation after death and the fact that your soul continues but your body is turned into something else, whether it's another animal, another human being, that sort of thing. And the cycle goes on and on and on until eventually you reach this final state um, where you no longer return in a body. So I, I looked into that and it was just something that um, I felt like there had to be something more than that, that there had to be, and Hinduism didn't really have regular prayers, like you can there was no structure to it, there were no rules as in Islam. So for me as a person wanting to follow a path of God, it was very difficult because there was no set direction. It was more like, you know, don't be attached to life and don't be attached to materialism and respect all living things, and which is great, and there's concepts of ahimsa, which is non-violence, which was beautiful, but at the same time, there are no actual rules, no set, like set ways to worship um, on a daily basis, that sort of thing. So as beautiful as it is, especially the idols um, part of Hinduism was what I really disagreed with because how can you uh, assume a formation for God um, when God is unbound and omniscient and benevolent and all these sort of things. So that's kind of where I struggled. Hinduism is very cultured these days. So I found that the best way to study it was go to the text. 
So um, we have a book called the Bhagavad Gita, and it's um, a book in Hinduism. So I, I did read that. Um, I took courses in university, which I felt was the best way because I was a student at the time, and that was the best way for me to learn. And as you explore it more and more, of course, every, every religion has um, beautiful parts to it. And I think there's a coherent uh, connectedness between all religions. But um, there, I just felt that something was very big was missing. And there were some parts that just did not add up. But it was, I had a really great teacher of Indian philosophy when I was in my fourth year of university. And he really spent a lot of time with me to help understand it. And even through all that exploration, I still found a disconnect between what I believed and what the religion was saying. Um, I think at first they, they really did encourage it. I think any parent when their child wants to explore their own religion uh, would be very excited. Um, however, my parents themselves were brought up, br brought up in a Hindu family, but they themselves didn't explore it. So if I go to sit with my parents to talk about concepts of Hinduism, which are very basic, like the concept of duty or karma, they wouldn't be able to tell you about it because it's more cultured than um, actually practiced. So I find that they, they were supportive at first until I began to bring up questions which they couldn't answer. And of course, anybody, when you come to them with a question um, to challenge their beliefs, are going to feel taken aback by that, which is understandable. In my, in my third year of university was when I started taking religious courses, and that was obviously because I was curious. And it wasn't that I wasn't going to be Hindu anymore, but I think um, towards the fourth year, I started studying more about Christianity and Islam. And only last year was when I just decided I'm going to, after I did all my research and studied Islam, like I was reading Christianity and Islam, and I was leaning towards Islam, and then I studied the Sunni versus the Shia path. And that was when I decided I'm 100% sure, because if you're going to take such a big decision, you need to make sure you're 100% backed up. And the logic behind um, Islam is flawless. So that's something that really helped me in my decision because when you go looking for the answers and you find them, it's very encouraging towards a path. Um, it was it was exciting to see something different and to see and to see that there was something other than what I was brought up with my whole life. Um, of course, you're going to be so intrigued, and 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 the Bible itself is is structured very differently into the Old Testament, into the New Testament, into into words that are accommodated with an ancient science instead of a modern science. So there's so many different things you have to learn when you're studying it and to, to learn that there were prophets and people who guided us and lessons to be learned from. Uh, in Hinduism we do have that but not to as such an extent as Islam and Christianity. So it was very refreshing to read even if I wasn't going to follow it right away but stories of morality and ethics in, in Christianity. So. I studied it for two years. I took some courses here and there, and I'm not saying that taking a few courses would explain Christianity, but um, but there were still there was the element of prayer, the element of worship. I, I understand that um, you can pray whenever you want in Christianity, and you can attend church on Sundays if if that's the holy day. But there was still something I felt it wasn't enough because if there it was a God and if there was a Creator and He's blessing us all the time and there's like always mercy bestowed on us no matter what you do from when you wake up in the morning to when you go to sleep. Um, I just felt that it wasn't enough and it wasn't fulfilling what I what I needed in, in life. So, so Islam, um, I went to Toronto a few years ago to work uh, for an African AIDS organization for an internship because I was, I had just come back from Africa doing volunteer work there and I wanted to go pursue that further. I felt like it was something I needed to do. So I went to Toronto and while I was there, um, I had a lot of evenings free, so I would walk to chapters. <laughs> and at chapters, I would browse the religion section. And one day, I picked up a book on Islam, and I started to read it. And I read of Prophet Muhammad. And it was, once again, so intriguing to me because, because um, it was something different. And it was something I hadn't explored yet. So it started then, and I was slowly starting to read it. I had quite a few Muslim friends, and I, I grew up with them in quite a multicultural society here. but. I had never actually sat down to learn about it. And I think also a lot of that barrier was implicit. It was more so that society tells you that there's certain images of Muslims that you get put into your head. Especially coming from an Indian background, when you see Indian, uh, India and Pakistan conflict and Hindu-Muslim conflict, you grow up with that, even though you don't really understand it. So I think it was a barrier within myself I had to break down to, to pick up a book on Islam and to see exactly what I was being told wasn't really a path that I should be pursuing by, by society. So 
Um, it was then I started to read about it, and then when I came back, I started to connect more with my Muslim friends. I had some Sunni friends, and I finally met some Shia friends, and, and both of them told me, just look for the answers. I don't want to sway, but go search for the logic. And um, that's kind of where it started. Um, I think at first I didn't even know that I was looking at one side as opposed to the other. So sometimes you pick up a text and I'll be like, oh yeah, I was reading this book, for example. And, and my Shia friend would be like, oh, that's actually like a Sunni text. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize there was such a big difference. So um, it was, I think it was more holistic at first, but I wasn't realizing that it was biased. And so after that, um, I started exploring other texts like Najwa uh, Balaga from Imam Ali, alayhi salam. I read that. Online lectures are very helpful. So I would listen to some Sunni lectures on a topic, like Salat. And then I listened to some Shia lectures, and whichever, and it would just help me to understand the different sides, and then make an informed decision on which one I thought was more aligned with what what I believed. So I don't think I accepted it uh, holistically at first. I, I was intrigued by it first holistically, but then I, I'm my brain works in the way where I need to make sure 100 percent with the decision before I go forward. And so as soon as I, I spent quite a while, maybe six months to eight months, exploring the two sides. And um, alhamdulillah, I had friends from both sides who did show me different things and introduced me to different ways of learning. And it was when I realized um, that the Shia way, the way of Imam Hussein, the, the love of people for Imam Hussein that was so inspiring that I just, I couldn't ignore it. And um, I think that's, the love of the al Bayt that's found in the Shia religion, the, the, the role models we have, when you go back to the history and, and the events that actually did happen and ones that maybe did not happen but are articulated that they did, um, the logic was clear for me and that's kind of when I just decided that I wanted to be Shia. And it has, it's like I've never regretted that decision. I think it's the most logical and um, it's clear. So I think every, I think most Shia will tell you the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Um, you don't see that many people, millions of people, going to visit someone's grave for no reason. And I think that's something that caught my attention at first. Like, who who is this individual that's inspired people all over the world to come to come meet him? And um, so just the story of Karbala. And it's funny because I heard Imam Hussein's story. I read about it, and and there was no feeling invoked in me. I was like, okay, that's, you know, it's a good story. <laughs> it's a sad story. But as I started to, to learn more and more about it, as I started to watch more videos, as I started to talk to more people, like, it's amazing. It's amazing how, like, feelings manifest within you. And it's just, you start to, like, you, you start to want to cry for this person because it's so heartbreaking and how much they sacrificed and how much justice they brought to the world and how many people don't know about it. Um, like I spent 23 years growing up in Canada, and I never heard of Imam Hussein alayhi salam once. So it's um, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, there's so much beauty in it that so many people, like how Imam Hussein gets into your heart, it, it's it's amazing, and I think that's something that you can't break, and it's something that like Allah chooses to create within his Shia, and it's something that. Um, that that sort of story can help a lot of people who are looking to find what Islam's about explain a lot because there's so many examples of how how Muslims are supposed to behave and that that is the real Islam to me compo compared to what society or or the media's distorted for the image of Islam. Um, so I think the stories of the Alubayt and uh, you look at Hadith al Kisa for example, there's so much beauty in such a short. Hadith, and it's and it's just showing so showing people how how we should be living compared to how we do live, and and that's kind of what inspired, drew me towards um, the Shia path. Um, so last year before Ramadan, um, I think that maybe everybody's different, but I think sometimes Allah needs to shock the person, um, and that's what happened last year. Like I was. I was going through uh, lots with like work and school and friends and family, and something happened where I just I woke up and I was like I can't keep behaving the way I am, living the way I am. I can't keep acting like there isn't something more because what if tomorrow you wake up and you're not here anymore? It's going to be too late. 
and you can't keep putting off something that's so important to you because of the fact that societal norms aren't like that or your family won't accept it, whatever it may be. So I think that that sometimes um, Allah like instills some sort of blessing on you where you might go through a period of of suffering or pain or whatever it may be, but you come out, but he wakes you up with that. He makes you realize how much you need him when you're going through that. And, and after that point, it was um, before Ramadan that I decided to, to, to take my shahada and, and convert. And that was the time I bought my first hijab and started wearing it to work and everything. So I think it was the worst time, the hardest time I've ever gone through in my life and the time I was the weakest and the most vulnerable and the time I needed forgiveness the most. But at the same time, you come out of it a totally new person. So, um, so yeah, that, that would have to be it. I think it was more so just, just, it's almost like when you're tested in so many different aspects of your life all at once. So it's not just being tested with family, it's not just being tested with, with a friend, whatever it may be. It's so many tests at once, and it's whether or not you can come out of that test stronger or, or whether you accept failure with it, that makes the difference. So I, that's all. It was just mostly there were very many things going on with my family, with my work, with my school, with personal like, relationships with friends, and, um, and it, was, it was the tipping point, basically. It, was, it feels like, like you're given a second chance at life. Um, it feels like for once in your life, everything is aligning perfectly. And it was still hard after I converted because I don't think it would have been so much of a problem if I just converted. But deciding to wear the hijab was such a big thing for my family, which is understandable because you see, when you have children, you hope to raise them in a certain way. You see them in a certain light that you project on them, the image you want to see them become. And I think for my parents, they were like, you can pray, you can fast, you can do this, but why do you have to, like, why do you have to inhibit yourself by wearing a hijab? So uh, it was very difficult, and alhamdulillah, like, they've accepted it now. But during that time, and even coming to work for the first time, I work at the United Way, which is a charity. And I work as a manager there. And when you come in just wearing um, a scarf, there's a lot of questions, a lot of curiosity. But everyone's accepted it now. It's, it's a new identity given to you. You're a new person. And Allah says those who convert, like, they're like a newborn baby, right? So. Uh, and we're so lucky that the kind of mercy even exists because you are a completely different person and your actions are governed differently. Before you convert, you're not thinking of anybody but your own desires. That's just how it is. Even if you have a moral code, you still function on desire. But, when, but after converting now, your lens is shifted and you see everything through Allah, like how this will affect my religion, how this small decision will affect the people around me. So, it's almost like a, a barrier to, to acting on just desire. And I think that we're so lucky um, that, that that option exists for people who want to convert that, that some people think maybe they've, they've done so much wrong in their life, if that's how you want to say it, and that they could never be accepted. Like, why would Allah accept me? But he gives, there's so much mercy in the religion that he gives you the chance to be a new person. And it's so amazing that that exists. Um, so we were talking about logic and researching and finding out answers for yourself when you're about to convert and I think that despite that um, sometimes people need a push that's maybe in front of their eyes a little more clear and alhamdulillah I think I met somebody here in Edmonton a friend of mine and he he really was one of the main reasons that that pushed me um, in the direction that I that I went because when I met this person they, they emulated now with my understanding of the religion, everything that Shia Islam represents. And if I were to take all the lessons of Karbala, all the teachings of, of sacrifice, of justice, of mercy, um, I would find them in this person. And I think that as Muslims that's so important because sometimes when you uh, exclude uh, or show the, the qualities of Karbala to others, they see them. And it was so different in him. And even when I was converting and it was very hard and I was trying to learn, it was, he still did not give up. And it's kind of, to me, the analogy of when Imam Hussein was going to Karbala and he had so many with him and only 72 stayed. It's kind of that idea of, of never giving up on something that is the right way. And I saw that so clearly in him. And I think that um, Allah 
Alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful. Send me this person knowing that that's what I needed to push me towards the right way. And I think also, as we talked about earlier, um, when you convert to Islam, you're like a newborn baby. Um, and they say that, and just like any child, they're going to be watching and doing what their parents are doing. And they're going to grow up emulating what their parents are doing. So if you have a parent who prays and fasts and you see them every single day um, worshiping God, you're going to grow up doing the exact same thing. And I was so lucky, <laughs> and I think about it now and I didn't see it before, that um, Allah sent me someone who prayed five times a day, who woke up for Fajr, who fasted every day of Ramadan no matter what. And because within the first year of my conversion, that's what I saw, that's the kind of Muslim I've become because I was like a child following this parent. And I'm so lucky for that person. And I really wish Allah will bless them um, on the Day of Judgment for even just this, his action of helping me um, gain my way towards Islam. I think, um, so when you're first researching and looking, uh, I had Sunni and Shia friends who were encouraging me to do research, but he was really helpful in aiding me to understand further my decision and very supportive afterwards and continues to be. And Alhamdulillah, I'm so lucky for the amount of mercy um, he's shown towards me. And it's one of the reasons I chose to convert because when you see this person praying and fasting, and there's so much beauty in the religion, and you're seeing it before you instead of just reading it, I think it creates a, a difference in your heart rather than just in your eyes. So um, I'm very grateful for that. No, there was never a time I regretted making my decision and never a time being like, I wish I didn't do this. Um, it's more so the fact that, and I think that's because I did do my research before. So if you're wanting to make such a big decision, you need to be 100% believing that it is the right decision. If you're 50% or if you're being influenced by your friend, whatever it may be, you're not going to be strong enough to, to go through with it because you yourself don't intrinsically believe in what you're doing. So I think I was very lucky because I, I knew it was the right thing. So even when it was hard, because I knew it was the right thing, it made it easy. So um, I think it's very important for people who want to convert to make sure they do their research. And, and Islam is a religion where there's, there's nothing hidden. Like You can find everything. You can find the logic. You can make connections. And if you just take the time to do that, it'll strengthen your belief. So when I took my shahada, there was so much support from the women's side there. I think I got about a thousand kisses that day because people were so happy. And, and I, I um, split my time between the Indian Pakistani mosques and the Lebanese mosques. So I go in between, and both groups of sisters are so welcoming. Sheikh Osama was, is so supportive. Anytime you need um, anything, I just email him. Like, I, I never thought it would be that easy to ask somebody for advice. And um, I, luckily, I have Shia friends here who are so supportive whenever I have questions. Families, it's very difficult um, being a convert when you have a Hindu family who just doesn't want to understand. And Allah says you have to respect your parents in every way, except in the way of Islam. So if they don't um, understand that, that's OK. But I still have to respect them. At the same time, it's so nice because some of these Shia sisters have off, are like a second family almost to me. Like I'll go to their house, and their fathers or their mothers will, will be like your daughter to us. And that's so beautiful to have. And I, I think they've been very accepting. And um, I've made quite a few friends within the community, which is, which is great. Um, I'm not upset. It's more disheartening because you hope that if you, you see your daughter taking a new step towards something, maybe they'll try to understand. But uh, they, like they've, my mother even told me, like I don't really want to understand. But Allah talks about those people in the Quran where they've like their hearts are sealed, their ears are sealed, their everything's sealed. So you can only try so much. But inshallah, like they'll they'll see. Um, like my mom's seen me pray, my dad's seen me pray, they see me wear hijab, but they just rather not ask questions. So it's it's not so much, um, it's not, I'm not like angry about anything, it's more disheartening because you're hoping maybe you can open somebody else's heart um, to Islam. And if, if so, then Allah will, will, if Allah wills it, it'll happen. And if not, then um, there's only so much you can do. I think we are we are human. And I think Islam has come to give us rules. And the rules that are in place, are logical and they're there to make you happy so like even those certain things are haram or certain things 
are there's like rules for this and this and this um, how you pray how what you dress how you speak lowering your gaze they're there to to um, in the end make the believer happy and to, to have let them have the best life they could possibly have and as Muslims I don't think we can ever do enough and you look at um, Imam uh, Mahdi alayhi salam he needs 313 followers and we're in 2013 so of course there's always more we can do and there's so much going on in the world right now where, where Sh Shia Muslims uh, need our help and I think that that's a very difficult question because can you ever say that you're praying enough or you're fasting enough or you're worshiping enough so um, as a whole I don't think we're doing enough and I don't think we ever can and that's one of the beautiful things about Islam is that there's mercy on, on us for being human but at the same time I think we should always strive to be better in our faith and sh and strive to, to live more like the Alubayt because we're so caught up these days in consumerism and having this and and um, and, and cultural bounds. I've found that culture and religion are two separate things and sometimes they're treated as one and they get mixed and I think that we need to start looking at people's faith rather than the culture they come from because we're missing out on so much by doing that. I think for sure that um, I wish it was more accessible but at the same time people have barriers within themselves that sometimes if you would approach me and I'm not in the right mindset to be receptive to you because of whatever, my upbringing, my beliefs, whatever it may be, it can actually backfire. But I think that as Muslims we have a duty to go talk about our religion, to tell people who is Imam Hussein in a way that doesn't, um, that doesn't intrude on other people's beliefs, but is more of a, uh, of a knowledge sharing experience rather than this is what Islam is, uh, you should believe it. So I think it's very important as Muslims that we spread the word of Imam Hussein, spread the word of Allah, but at the same time we have to be we have to also respect the moral codes that we're brought up with by being respectful to other religions. If you're not, um, if someone's not your brother in, your, in faith, they're your brother in humanity, as we all know. So I think that's very important to know um, if we're going to be taking that approach. But I think education is always very important and it should be more accessible. But as, I think as soon as you go looking for it, it was very easy to find and it was easy to connect with people. So um, I think our community is very good at doing that and making people feel welcome. I think um, I think anytime you have something negative in the media and people aren't uh, accustomed to seeing the other side of it, that it can be portrayed as a, a deterrent to people coming to Islam. Um, but at the same time, I think there are, we're, we're human before we are Muslims. And so if you're going to have humans who act um, poorly, no matter no matter what religion they're from. You're always going to have humans who do not abide by morality or by ethics or who believe that killing is wrong. So I think that um, unfortunately the media has taken this lens on Muslims uh, for whatever reason that may be. But I think then it's something, if it's something we cannot control then we can only deter it by being, by showing those around us what real Islam is like, by being a good Muslim to those friends around us, by our community, so that we can change the face of Islam to instead of what they see on the media to the person they meet, um, that then really nice Muslim lady or Muslim man who they met at a conference or something like that. So I think the media unfortunately has a lot to play in it, but if people go to educate themselves, I think they will find differently. So, um, I think my favorite is um, from Imam Ali alayhi salam, and he says to be like the flower who leaves its fragrance even to the hand that crushes it. And I think as Muslims that speaks, that resonates so highly with us because you're always going to face tribulations. But if you believe in what's right, then like be sweet, be compassionate, show mercy that to others that Allah is showing to you every single day. And I think that's all we, can, we could possibly do.